of the Pledge of Allegiance. Where people can invest. 
On a personal note, just a little bit about me for any of you who don't know my background. I am a partner with the Van Winkle Law Firm, which is just across the street here. Uh, I've been with Van Winkle since 2002. I am married to uh, Mark Harris, who is a high school teacher and wrestling coach at Bank High School and is in the picture on your table, along with a picture of our three, our three boys who are six, nine, and 11, uh, and all attend public school here in Asheville. We are, my husband and I are lucky enough also to have all of our grandparents, our parents, our children's grandparents living in this community as well. And you can see that it's important to me personally that this remain a place that's wonderful, vibrant, uh, and succeeds for all of us so that we can continue to enjoy Asheville. Um, I'm going to leave it there, cut my time a little, not use up all my time, uh, and leave it for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Good afternoon. My name is John Lyle. I know a few of the folks here. I've uh, been a lifelong uh, native, lifelong resident of Asheville, uh, born in West Asheville, uh, graduated from Asheville High School in 1970, graduated from Andre Anderson Junior College in 1972, and graduated from UC Asheville in 1975. I uh, went to work for the city of Asheville, in all honesty, thinking I might spend a couple of years here before I moved on to life. And uh, 30 years later, I was walking out of the door retired. So, so my life was not exactly what it started out to be, but it could not have been better. I learned very quickly in my city experience that I'm, I'm very passionate about serving, whether serving in the community through city of government or through boards and, and, and nonprofits in the community on the United Way and Red Cross and Girl Scouts and Family Services and also as Counseling Center. I've tried to do my part to make Asheville the community it is today and to make it better at every turn. Uh, I also have three adult children, uh, all of whom live in the Asheville area, my oldest daughter and her husband and their three-year-old live out in the South Asheville area, and of course, my son and his family just are finishing a, uh, their first home uh, out of the Fairview area, and my youngest daughter uh, lives uh, more or less south of that, uh, downtown Asheville, and is uh, due to be married uh, next June, so, so uh, we're uh, looking to fund a wedding if anybody would like to contribute to that. Um, I am genuinely touched by the outpouring of support and interest that I've encountered in this campaign. Uh, everything so far has exceeded my expectations. I have a wonderful team starting with my wife and my, my manager, Tom, and, and, and a great committee. Um, I want to say, too, that it was especially rewarding last week. I, I've been very pleased to see employees for all the years I was there. I've retained those relationships. But uh, last week, we were so blessed to receive the uh, endorsement of the Police Development Association, uh, which is one of the two major law enforcement uh, uh, organizations in the community. Uh, PDA representing, of course, uh, uh, local law enforcement, uh, police officers, deputies, and the State Highway Patrol in the Western North Carolina region. I, I think that's a tremendous set of confidence from, from perhaps the people that know me best, the, the people that I worked with and served with for many years. Uh, I have a couple of things I want to get into today, hopefully in the question and answer. I'm very, very concerned about the city's financial or fiscal uh, position. Uh, we will talk about that. But there are four key components to my campaign I'm going to leave you with at this point. And it's an acronym called SAVE. The S stands for stewardship. I want our elected officials to represent the stewardship. A is for accountability. I, I, I'm as frustrated as some of you are that every time I turn around there's another explosion in the city government, we need accountability. V is for vision, and E is for experience. And with my 30 years inside, I can now know the organization inside out and bottom up. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Vice Mayor, I'm going to ask you the first question that's uh, all right from CBO. What are the top three things you will change if you become mayor, and why would you change them? Um, thank you. That's a good. That's a good question. Um, one of the top issues for facing Asheville is um, 
fiscal sustainability, ensuring that our city has a healthy budget and is strong fiscally so that it can continue to invest in this community. Um, we we uh, experienced some unique challenges to Asheville. Because of that, it's been important to uh, create an economic development plan going forward that will ensure our fiscal stability. I have done that along with my fellow council members and begun that plan, and I hope to be able to get into it a little bit more with you today, but it hinges on investing in this community. And this is a pamphlet, you know, you can come up here and grab it after we're done, that looks, that shows you the capital improvement investment we are going to be making and I'm going to be supporting in the next five years into this community to ensure long term that we are able to stay strong financially and not have to rely on the fluctuations of state government or federal government and we can depend on ourselves for our own fiscal health. That is the primary issue because under that uh, flows all other sorts of things in terms of being able to do all the projects that people want and need in our community. Street repair, sidewalk repair, greenway investments, um, all sorts of things, garbage pickups, and police and fire. All those basic city services you have to be able to count on. And how do you ensure long term that you're going to have the finances to be able to do that? You have to be able to grow from within. And cities survive primarily on property taxes, and the only way to ensure that you're going to increase that revenue is by investing in your community so that you can raise up everyone. Thank you. You want me to repeat the question? I think I heard you. Yeah. Thank you. Three things that I would do as mayor. Number one is to improve the city's fiscal or financial position. Secondly, is to is to deliver an invigorated or reinvigorated economy. Asheville's had a long and, and, and wonderful history with tourism, but it is very uh, 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 soft, and soft in the sense that when we get hard at down times, the first thing that people do is don't take the vacation, they don't take travel that they would otherwise take. Uh, to a great degree, our economy in the local area has largely been based on tourism. And it's not a bad thing, I'm not against tourism, but I would expand our economic base to include perhaps some health care related often opportunities that we have all the pieces to succeed at. And thirdly, is to, is to bring this community together. Uh, I'm, I'm tremendously concerned about the division that I see that the city council, in my opinion, has, has, has made a lot of decisions that are based on special interest. I want to focus on one element of that right now, which is the financial position. Back on April the 18th this year, some of you may have been a civic center when you heard the sky, the fiscal sky is falling presentation. We're going to have to close parks and pools and fire stations to realize that everything was just going to pot and basket. And then a few weeks later, in the month of June, as they began the only public hearing they had on the budget, what we heard was, well, it's not as bad as we originally thought, so one or two cents may do the trick on tax increase. Two weeks later, when they were presented with the budget, they not only didn't stick to that, they hit us with a four cent increase, a $7.50 tax, tax to pick up my trash and recycle, which was new, uh, largely and a $10 million raise to an art museum. I contend this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a purist when it comes to local government. For the first time in the history of the city of Asheville, they're not picking up our trash for our tax dollars. I think that's fundamentally wrong. We have to get core government services first and foremost before we can even begin to think about missing <laughs> museums or any non-governmental service. That's my position. Okay. As mayor, will you push for the I-26 connector project, even if it is eight lanes? <laughs> eight or eight hundred, we need relief. It's that simple. I was at the New York Casino breakfast a few weeks ago uh, when uh, former mayor Mike Love spoke. And if you'll remember, he asked the most prominent questions. I worked under Ken both as a city manager and later as mayor. Ken has this haunting way of summing things up with the fewest words, and sometimes painful that I've ever been around. But he asked that day, he said, for 25 years, we've talked about an I-26 connector, and that will relieve a lot of the pressure on I-240 Charlotte Street. When are we going to quit talking, and when are we going to do it? 
I don't think it's a question of how many lanes. I think it's a question of how committed are we. And Asheville does have a history of this. Uh, those of you that have lived here a long time, like I have, you remember the I-240 open cut. Was it a tunnel or a cut? Chris Peterson, you and I grew up about the same time. We went to high school at the same time. Back to the 50s, we were debating a tunnel or a cut. Somebody finally bit the bullet and we had to cut. We've got to get off center and get that connector built. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. I'm going to support I, the I-26 project, of course. We need the I-26 project. That, that, that is not a question. And we have been stymied in moving that forward. Um, there is a working group right now. I've got Mark Hunt in the room, and David King it isn't on the working group, but Joe Belcher is. Um, and Jan, I'm not recalling. Uh, you are as well. That's right. <clears throat> These folks recognize, and I recognize, that it's only through partnerships that we're going to be able to get I-26 done. The state needs to recognize that we are working with the city and the county and our local partners to come to an agreement about the I-26 project. They don't want to fool around with us if we're going to sit around and fight about it. And so we, that's not what's happening anymore. There's a lot of constructive work that's happened. Um, former Mayor Lou Bissett is also involved in that project. And they're closing in on an agreement about what to recommend in terms of the I-26 project. And to be honest, I'm not sure if the recommendation is going to include six lanes or eight lanes or whatever the case may be. But whatever the recommendation is, I'm going to support it because that's what it's going to take. We have to have all of our community leaders support that project, make that known to the state if we ever hope to move up in the ranking in terms of being able to get it financed and constructed in a timely fashion. Thank you. Question. Number three, do you feel the stormwater utility that collects the monthly fee is affected, and why? That is a good question. Um, this last July, we saw how effective some of our stormwater infrastructure was when we saw some slides happen on, on in different areas, and we know that we need greater improvement and greater work in stormwater infrastructure. The, the question again is whether we need it or want it or... Do you feel that the stormwater utility that collects the monthly fee is effective? It's effective. And why? The, it is growing effectiveness. We have done several capital projects on stormwater mitigation, which is just simply means put it in infrastructure to handle stormwater. We're an area that experiences flooding, we're susceptible to slides, and we can't ignore it. We have to have infrastructure in place to do that. That's the purpose of the stormwater fee. I know there's been some complaints about the fee over time, but the city collects that fee, runs it out of its own enterprise fund, separates it. It's very transparent. You can see exactly what projects are in line to occur for stormwater mitigation, uh, and you can see exactly how that money is being spent. Several projects have happened already. More are slated to happen. And clearly, that is needed. It has, be, has been effective, but it needs to be more effective and will be with the proper use of those funds. In a word, no. I am a big proponent of measuring outcomes. And I have yet to see the metrics. I have yet to see any measures. I have yet to see anything that that tax or that fee has gone to improve. We need to be able to measure things when we're paying fees and taxes for it. That said, let me expand the question just a tad further. I would advocate for a complete review of all city fees. Let me explain why. This summer, my wife and I put in a new heating and cooling system in our home, energy efficient. We did, we did as green as we could afford to do. And I get a certificate that says that I could get a, a credit from, from, from Progress Energy for having done that. We submitted that. And then I get a letter from the city inspection's office. I didn't apply, just I guess they picked it up off of the permitting process. The city inspection's office says that if I'm age 65 or older, I may get something. I thought, what, well, we're only encouraging green, if you know, the, the current council is so green-minded, we're only encouraging green for people who are 65 years of age or older? What about the people like my son who are building a house right now? Why are we not incentivizing them? A final point on fees would be his house. He informed me the day before yesterday something I'm still trying to get my mind around. Was the city inspector, first of all, they're in the ETJ, the old ETJ. They pulled their permit to build their house back in April this year before the law changed. So the city has, has control. Uh, although we no longer, the city would no longer uh, 
exercise of inspection authority in the ECJ, they were grandfathered in because they pulled the permit. The inspector came out the other day and was doing what they thought would be the final inspection prior to moving in and said, well, you still don't have any grass growing. They sung the grass seed, they had the straw out, but the fellow told them, he said, until I come back and see no three square foot area in the yard without a blade of grass, I cannot pass your, 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 your CO. And they said, well, that can take forever. He said, well, you can pay another $250 fee and we can give you a temporary CO. Folks, what we've done is institutionalized graft, in my opinion. If that grass needs to grow that bad, let it grow. Thank you. Do you favor district elections for the city council? I do not. However, I could live with it. That, that's, uh, everybody in this room is very, very politically astute. And the legislature, by nature, in the state of North Carolina, controls everything that local government can do and, and will do. The legislature could change that any time they choose to. Will I would live with it anyway. Now, now, now that said, I, I can take you back again through the history of my experience in City Hall. I worked with what I consider some of the giants in city leadership over the last 40 plus years. I saw men and women who were elected to public office, and some of those folks who exist on the council right now who have a vision for an entire city, not just a neighborhood and not just a district. I think we further segment this community when we go to district elections. If that's imposed upon Asheville at any time, I would hope we would have at least a mix of districts and, and, and uh, at large uh, representative, uh, uh, representatives elected, and certainly keep the mayoral office at, at large. So, A, I don't, I don't favor it, but I could live with it if, if we could get it done right. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Um, I'm fairly neutral on whether or not uh, Asheville has district elections. It, it's unfortunate that it might be imposed on us, um, but, I, but I don't see that it would be a great harm. The proposal was to divide the city into five districts and have one at large and, and then the mayoral race at large. And it does encourage um, representation from areas of the city that might not traditionally have representation. Uh, so it's somewhat of a sort of political science, academic conversation, if you will. I do um, think that Asheville is a little bit small for district elections. We're only 85,000 people, so it would be a little atypical to have a city our size have district elections. Thank you. You ready for your next? All right. All right. Number five. Do you favor the continuation of an appointed Asheville City School Board, or do you favor an elected Asheville City School Board, and why? Well, it would be great if they were elected so I wouldn't get blamed for appointing them. Um, so selfishly. Uh, but I do think that um, it's a difficult job to do, to serve on the school board. We have an elected county school board uh, and an appointed city school board. And I, I think that you definitely get a different type of um, person who's willing to run for office to serve on a school board rather than be appointed based on qualifications by a city council. So again, it, you know, something of a, a bit of an academic discussion about the pros and cons of both. There are pros and cons of both, and I think the biggest pro for an elected school board is the accountability issue. And I think that people would feel that that was better addressed through an elected school board. Thank you. Thank you. I would actually favor uh, direct elections to the school board after a preliminary conversation involving the entire community on whether or not we sustain two school systems going forward. Asheville was one of only three counties that I think is only three in the 197 percent of the counties in the state have a single school system. I think we have to have that conversation. That city school system represents 15 cents on a tax rate for you and I as city residents. I'm not, I'm not married to the idea that we keep it or that we merge it, but I am married to the idea that we need to have a conversation about why that needs to continue. Once we have that conversation and have a decision as a community, then I think it's appropriate to maybe consider whether to make the people that are currently appointed more directly accountable to the people who serve the election. Thank you, John. Uh, this concludes our questions. Now, we're going to open it up for the audience. Chris, did you have a question? 
Um, the I live in North Asheville, and there's been under the current city council three studies spending in excess of fifty thousand for each study. Each study has said, "Don't do this. It's going to cause chaos." To change it from four lanes to three lanes with a bike lane. Now, if you travel that street, anybody from four o'clock on, it's packed. Now that this council has again kicked it back to PNZ. So I'm asking, as mayor, what do you plan to do with this situation? So what Chris is asking about is the Charlotte Street um, study that was just recently concluded regarding whether or not to take Charlotte Street from four lanes to three lanes. I too live in North Nashville, travel Charlotte Street and have experienced it as well. And it, it is uh, not going to be easy, it's going to go back to planning and economic development. And the issue is, how do you balance continued economic vibrancy, supporting those commercial businesses along that strip, and accommodating the neighborhood's need for better sidewalks, better pedestrian ways on Charlotte Street? I think that we're realizing that a bike lane is not going to fit on Charlotte Street. It's just not going to be enough for it. So I, there, this, the staff of the city is bringing suggestions for how to deal with Charlotte Street, but. From my perspective, my primary concern is that we make sure we don't inhibit the commercial activity on Charlotte Street, and there's room for more there. There's many properties not being fully utilized, uh, and, but at the same time, providing a more safe environment for pedestrians to be able to use that because it is uh, an odd mix of commercial with neighborhoods sitting immediately surrounding it. But but don't. Don't be concerned that this city council or my, me myself will do anything to 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 harm this business as long as true. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Excuse me. I could not agree more. The five studies related to which I believe cost fifty thousand dollars, all of which said leave it alone. At some point, we ought to get the message and leave it alone. But that said, I was at the council meeting a few weeks ago when that last report was presented. And an idea occurred to me, and I'm not a municipal planner, I know a lot of those people, but I don't claim to have that expertise particularly. But an idea occurred to me, we need what traffic lanes we've got to do traffic. That is the first and most uh, purposeful use of a road. We need to move traffic. The sidewalks are less presently, I clearly understand, because of the number of driveway cuts. We've got businesses, a mix of businesses, and some residential, I think. But the bottom line is we're stuck with what we've got. And then the idea occurred to me is why don't we have it out of the box? What's the possibility? What's the possibility of the city looking into acquiring a right of way to the rear of some of those lots on Charlotte Street for a sidewalk and a bike path? Might that not be more conducive to keeping traffic flowing and accommodate all the needs that people say they have of that corridor? I'm just saying, we seem to just be stuck on, we'll keep hiring consultants until we hear what we want to hear, which is where you the text on the lines. I think we need to get way outside the box in Charlotte Street and look at all the possibilities. Thank you, John. Question. I'm concerned about the fiscal, the financial stability of our city. Um, I know that, uh, for instance, five years ago, six years ago, we, our health care for city employees were self-insured for about $5 million to the fund. Today, that money is gone. They have contracted with an insurance carrier to carry it. Um, the required reserve from the local government commission, uh, I think we've actually, the city has received a letter, expressing concern about that reserve being so low. So my question is, why has this happened? And how do we stop it from continuing to happen with the exception of just having a great big tax increase? How do we control spending? Why did it happen? Where did the spending go? What do we do to make sure that we get on stability on a stable ground. Um, let me let me just clarify one thing right now. Asheville has a very healthy reserve reserve account. 
It greatly exceeds the stated requirement of basically your savings account. There's guidelines and recommendations for what cities should have, and ours is very healthy. And I think what you're alluding to is a 2011 letter that was sent from the LGC to the city remarking about our reserves. They immediately sent a corrective letter saying they were mistaken and our reserves are fine. Uh, and I think that's what you're talking about. That is not that is not a concern. Our, our, many of you know our city manager, Gary Jackson. He's been with us since 2005, and he's done an excellent job of making sure that we keep our finances in line, healthy, we keep our enterprise funds healthy and appropriate reserves. The issue, though, for Asheville is that we don't enjoy things, we don't get a bed, better tax, we don't get a food and beverage tax. I'm not standing up here advocating that we should. It's just a reality. So we need to be able to operate with property taxes, sales taxes, and fees. That's a city's bread and butter base. And over half of our general fund, which is about $90 million, goes to the police and the fire. So if you, if you want to be able to be a, an out-of-the-box city, provide something more for your community, and not be one of the mill, you've got to be able to have the resources to do that. And how do you do that? You've got to grow your city. You've got to make it a place where you can invest and you can grow your business. Because when you grow your business, you enhance the value of your property, you pay, they pay your employees well, and that brings something to our economy as a city, and we can pay for things that everyone enjoys. That is why uh, the city has partnered with the Chamber of Commerce in adopting the 5 by 5 plan, which is an economic development plan that looks to see a diverse economic development plan so that we can grow our economies in the various sectors that Asheville is, is good at, what we already are good at, and expand and grow on that, whether it's medicine, whether it's the arts, you name it. Thank you. At the infamous April 18th meeting at Civic Center, I referenced a while ago, one of the things I heard Lauren Bradley, former finance manager for the city of Asheville, said the state was, that our expenses, the city's expenses, are increasing five times faster than revenues. Think about that. So I went back and looked at the city's website, all the stuff has to be put online. The city's own audited financials for the year ending June 30th of 2011 show that in that 12 month period ending, June 30th of 2011, the city's revenues increased 3.8%. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I didn't get a raise that year. I said it wrong, it's 2012. But, but uh, June 3rd, 2012, but I didn't get a 4% increase in pay in 2012, did you? The city's latest quality financials posted online showed that last year they had an increase of 2.6% in revenues. I submit to you that if you have two years that show 3.8% and 2.6% increase in revenues respectively, and your expenses are growing five times faster than that, you don't have an income problem, you've got a spending problem. And that's where I think we fundamentally need to focus. I am so glad that, that uh, uh, Mr. Mannheim referenced a, a letter in 2011. I have something that I received recently from a, a public records request from the Local Government Commission. Those of you who don't know that, don't know about that. The Local Government Commission is a, is a government entity out of, out of uh, state treasury office in Raleigh that has absolute total control over everything to do with local government finance. In January of 2011, they wrote a letter to the mayor that's because she's the mayor, wasn't because she did anything particularly wrong. And they really, really spanked the city. Number one, that the city's fiscal year budget ending June 30th of 2010 was supposed to be, the audit financials were supposed to be in LGC's hands until later in October. The LGC didn't receive those until January of 2011, six months later. Further, there were two material deficiencies noted in the city's own audit. Funds coming in, uh, revenues coming in with funds were, un were overstated and expenses going out were understated. And lastly, bank reconciliations weren't being done. They're not even balanced in the checkbook, ladies and gentlemen. I have another. Thank you. While we're flogging this uh, North Asheville car and mule, uh, this is a quick question, and maybe you can answer it in yes or no. Is there any, it would either of you consider uh, establishing a new study on the part of North Asheville from uh, Charlotte Street down Kimberly Macon and Murdoch 
concerning all the bow mass and, and uh, Senator Cleese, all that concrete we put in there after we stored $350,000 to throw part in and put it in there. In, in regard to the effectiveness of that uh, uh, so called safety program and the dangers and, and the uh, lack of safety. Yes, Jerry does not like what we call our, the traffic calming measures on Edwin and Kimberly, uh, and he and I have talked about this several times, I think, uh, over the years. Um, and, and it was part of an arrangement with the Grove Park and when they built their condos that they would fund traffic calming because there was a concern that there would be increased traffic. Uh, in the neighborhood as a result. Um, and there were some hiccups, I think, in terms of people learning to drive around them and not over them. Although periodically sometimes people still drive over them. <laughs> um, I, at this point, I, I think the community has absorbed them and figured out, for the most part, how to maneuver around them. And the neighborhoods have very much enjoyed planting uh, in them, if you've seen it, if you've seen them to uh, landscape the, the streetway. Uh, so it would be hard to reverse course in that regard. I think Jerry would be challenging. But I certainly am open to making changes to make uh, streets more usable for everyone, uh, especially vehicles, because we don't want to have uh, streets that are hard for anyone to use or inhibit uh, activity from happening. So I don't, I, I'd be open to some changes if it were needed. Thank you. The interest of one more answer? No. I'll give you one better than that. I will advocate that we get as much of the concrete globs out of the streets as we possibly can. I was the city's risk manager for 15 years. The city self funds all its liability and a lot of its benefit programs. So I, I was like the insurance company. Anything that went wrong, I could deal with it. To that extent, from the day the first bolt out went into place, I had claims. People were hitting those things. There's no Again, I said a few minutes ago, the purpose of a paved road is to express traffic. Everything else we do that inhibits that creates a problem. I am a tremendous advocate of slowing people down. Perhaps we need more officers on the street. Perhaps we need more tickets written. I don't know what all the solutions might be to getting people under control if, if they're speeding and, and driving recklessly. But I can tell you, everything we put out in the street not only reduces the flow of traffic, but in its own way, raises the possibility of public liability claims against the city of Asheville. I was never a fan of them. I didn't like them when I was in City Hall. And I see it to be able to move as humanly possible. Thank you. Question? Uh, I'm a city planner, oh, and I have to be in the start. You um, Based on a tip, uh, from city, a city employee, I had a public request for information uh, to see how city employees have gotten raises over the last couple of years. Um, the research showed that department heads mostly have been given raises over the last couple of years, uh, while the people at the lower end of the totem pole were, were not able to, to have races. So my question is, um, will you uh, continue to encourage picking favorites uh, with, with uh, giving raises to city employees, or will you have a different approach? I think the premise of the question is incorrect. City uh, adopts an annual budget every year, pay raises for city employees, and that is part of a public process. Uh, and it's usually established in a percentage, or, or there's been several years where there haven't been raises. Uh, but this last year, we were able to provide raises for the first time in a long time. So that, I'm not sure where information is coming from, but that's a public process and it's in this budget right here, which is available to anybody. Uh, Tim, the first half of my 30 years in local government, roughly, were in the human resources department, so I'm very close to, to, to the issue of paying benefits. That said, I saw this cycle play out many, many times over 30 years. 
What we typically see happen is the city will invest in a pay plan. We can bring in consultants to help us decide what rates to pay or commensurate with the market rates for those positions. And other cities, the same time to roughly the same time as Asheville. We devote ourselves to a pay plan. And everything goes down for a couple of years until we hit a little economic bubble. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bubble down the road or something that trips us up financially. And then we stop. And then after a couple of years, our pay lag is so far behind then we have to start the process all over again. So to that extent, what you described is not new, but here's the part that's troublesome. I have seen similar information uh, on city payroll that indicates that, that some people got raises in the last three years, while others did not. While the people that police our streets, pick up our trash, put out the fires, that the people we depend on for the quality of life we expect in Nashville got nothing. Some people, pretty far up the food chain, did in fact get racist. That's flawed. We need to treat people the same. Fact, the Asheville Police Department last week had two more resignations. One of one fellow I saw at lunch last Thursday arrested him over in Woodfin. Uh, uh, was a former Asheville police officer. I didn't know he left and he's joined the uh, Woodford Police Department, which typically has a lower starting rate to pay than Asheville. Our people are leaving in droves. We have to commit the same kind of mentality to putting our resources to work for us with salaries and benefits that we do with museums. That's my point. Uh, as someone interested in the uh, growth and the economic expansion of the city within our now very tightly determined boundaries, I have a question about consistency uh, in local government. I've always been taught that consistency in government is a cardinal virtue. It has predictability and gives people uh, a chance to understand the long-term picture of where the government is heading. So I'd like to ask how you feel about consistency in, uh, between current actions and master plans, major city redevelopment projects, and things of that kind. Um, what I would say about that is I, I do think that it's very important that when you're trying to make decisions for a city, uh, that you be able to have the context for making those decisions. You've got to have a plan. Uh, it is irresponsible to just pull something out of the sky and say, well, that sounds like a good idea today. Let's fund that. Let's do it. You, so what the city of Asheville, like well-planned cities, has done and is doing is to put together transportation master plans, uh, multimodal transfer plans, economic development master plans, um, such as the one I've mentioned, so that there is a plan for how to make sure our city grows and is vibrant. Uh, and it's within the context of those plans that you're able to make those year in and year out decisions about funding, about changes in city policy, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that doesn't happen overnight. These plans are multi-year plans, and that's simply what it takes. And I think that sometimes um, there's an impatience with the fact that a change doesn't happen one day or one week. Uh, but I think we can agree that the Asheville that we knew many, many years ago is very different from the one we have today. And that's because of planning and investment that has occurred. And, and within the last several years, I have been a part of that planning process and can see it moving forward, making our community stronger. Before I call people's names, I'd like to acknowledge them. There are two other people here today. I'm Mike Lanning, our National Police Officer, candidate for council, and Gwen Whistler, candidate for council. And I'm doing that because I'm going to reference Gwen. And in the interest of she may get a half a minute to speak, I want to point that. Now, I was at the meeting a few weeks ago when, when the uh, idea for the Eagle Market Street redevelopment uh, project came along again uh, in our history. It's come many, many times. And uh, what the council quickly did, and when seized on this, uh, was that the council uh, took $850,000 out of the CIP from all modal and devoted it then to the Market Street. I guess my point is this constant, never-ending slide of hand with the money and projects. Every good idea that comes down to pipe needs to be funding, even if we have to steal it from one fund and put it in another one, it seems to be what goes on. My manager, Tom Duckett, had a tremendous, uh, tremendously successful career uh, with a major corporation uh, 
in, in the private four, very much for profit sector. And Tom's got this monitor. I don't know if they gave you that in training or if you, know, if you developed it over time, but Tom reminds me constantly when we have conversations past behavior predicts future behavior. And to that extent, I would leave you with a thought on this question Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Is the city of Asheville the same city or a better city than it was four years ago? I think if we answer that question honestly, we know what we need to do on election day. Thank you. Um, a lot of your tax base is in the Central Business District in downtown Asheville. And I would like to know what you, if elected um, mayor, would do about the cleanliness issue, the increased graffiti. Um, how would you maintain that? Are you interested in supporting a downtown improvement district? If not, how are you going to um, basically solve the issue of the police leaving? We have openings in fire department. How are you going to protect the downtown area? Thank you. Good question. The downtown does generate much of um, the economy of this city, and I support that. And I recognize that keeping our downtown clean is very important. Keeping it safe is important. Businesses need to be able to function. And on the one hand, we become a very popular town, but on the other, that comes with some downside, and it needs management. Again, one of the headlines in this five-year plan is called Downtown Vitality. And it says, improve downtown cleanliness and sustainability by providing recycling on sidewalks and addressing cleanliness. And in the budget, um, no sleight of hand, uh, just right there in the budget, is, is an item to deal with downtown cleanliness. It's really what it's going to take, and what that's talking about is um, being able to employ a group to come in and, and routinely clean the downtown. Uh, and this is, this is something we haven't had to do before, but it's recognized that it's an absolute need now. And then also to deal with safety issues downtown. We've got panhandling, uh, we've got other issues going on downtown that come with our city being a popular city. Uh, but that takes staffing and it needs to be addressed. Uh, and I support making sure that it is addressed because it's a key component to making sure our businesses can stay open and they can function well. We would lay some other facts out in front of you to answer your question. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I was not a, a fan of the, the BID. I do not see the logic for downtown businesses to have to pay a higher tax to get basic services. And I said, let me run by some numbers with you. I'm told that the uh, Asheville Police Department is down 13 belly buttons. I'm using a, a, a term we call it. That's, that's, we, we've got roughly 14 positions that are vacant right now. However, we're over 30. Last week, I was told by an uh, uh, staff of the Asheville Police Department that we were short 32 people on patrol. Now, let me tell you what happens. I did a ride along a couple of weeks ago, and I know several candidates have done that recently. If you've never done it, I strongly encourage you to do that. You'll see our police and fire people in a way, even public works, in ways that you've never seen them before. But what I learned that night was how critically understaffed we are. One of the officers I spoke with at a traffic accident on the Hensley Road that night reminded me, he said, we now have a drug suppression unit inside the Asheville Police Department. He said, there were Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. He said, I'm sure they are going to have drug deals going down this town on Friday, Saturday night because there's nobody to work on. Last week, a retired police captain from the Asheville Police Department was giving his haircut. I'll give you his name if you want it. He told me, he said, this guy came up to him and said, are you having a cell space while I am retired? He said, well, I recognize your picture from stuff around the department. I'm an actual police officer. And my friend says, well, cool, what do you do? He said, well, I'm in logistics. Now, my thought when I was told that was, is this UPS or is this the police department? Logistics? And so my friend asked, what do you do in logistics? And this is a sworn officer. He said, well, we do, we order supplies for the police department. Ladies and gentlemen, we got, I learned we've got three sworn people who order toilet paper, pens, and pencils for the Asheville Police Department instead of the police chief's priest. The reason our downtown is to shake his hand is we haven't put our priorities in the right place. That's my position. Thank you.
Yes, I had an opportunity in the last four months to be speaking with some of our officers. And uh, our officers, the morale is the lowest that they can remember it being in their police department in the last 30 years. Uh, I'm wondering why we have gotten to the point that we are, and if, if, we, if you've got an answer, what are we going to do about it in the future? Yeah, going back to my initial comments today, the same concept of A was accountability. I don't think we have any accountability for when things go wrong. Uh, I think we, uh, I, I sincerely, my heart goes out to the uh, police chief, Chief Anderson. I, uh, I've got children, I've raised three children. Uh, those of you that have had children and been through those teen years, you, can, you know how incredibly tough they can be. I don't want to mix personal issues with, with professional but that said, there are clearly problems just on the Ashton Police Department. Tonight is 7 o'clock, I think it is. There's a meeting at the uh, Kenworth Presbyterian Church that was precipitated by a letter written to the council last week by a husband and wife who have been very active in their community watch program. And the letter clearly says, we're afraid to even go to the grocery store because people will break into our homes and our cars while we're gone. Folks, we've reached a very dangerous point in this town with law enforcement and security, and I think we better redouble the effort to see what's wrong. One other thing I point out, the council or the city manager has recently, I should say the council manager has hired uh, uh, two consultants, I believe, uh, to come in and help evaluate what may be wrong and what can be done about it. One of those people is the same consultant whose work resulted in the hiring of Chief Anderson. Again, where's the accountability if the same people that bought the chief here are some of the same people who are going to decide what can be done to make it better? I don't think we have accountability. Sorry, to look at me like. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me just say that I am. Uh, I am concerned about Asheville, but I, I, I don't see it in the negative light that I'm, that I'm hearing today from, from my opponent. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that all you're hearing is negative, because it's clearly not all negative. You all live here and enjoy this community and don't seem to be running away from it. Um, we have a challenge in the police department. We've got a problem, and it needs to be addressed. And it's being addressed right now. Uh, your city council is not in charge of hiring and firing police officers. That's not what your city council does. I can run into one in barbershop. I can talk to, I can go to the patrol or police and talk to them, and I do. And we have a problem, and it needs to be addressed. And I have impressed upon our city manager that it needs to be addressed right now. And he understands the urgency of that. And that is why this review is taking place. And I expect and will insist that fast action be taken to address it. We're not going to have a community that is unsafe. We strive to be the safest community in America. That's one of our strategic goals. So that, that's not an acceptable um, situation. It's not going to be um, acceptable to me. Uh, but it is being addressed, and I don't want all of you, you know, running home and buying new security systems for your house because you don't need to do that. That is not the situation we're facing. Thank you.